I want to thank everybody for uh, having me here today. I, as I said before the service uh, at Judson, uh, it's, it's great, I love my job and all this and that, but you basically are stuck there all the time, like you basically have to be there. And, and before I, um, I was the minister there, I was a Buddhist monk for seven years, and before that, I used to just wander the city and go to different, like I would pick a different church service every week. I miss that so much. So it's actually, I always love getting into like social halls and getting into like the nooks and crannies of a building. So I'm, if I didn't have, I'm on the, I'm on the clock, but, but uh, I'll have to like come sneak around the building at some point. So I feel like I really know the place. But um, so I talked about the spirituality of debt forgiveness and community and this and that, but I guess this is the time to open it up to any questions about this or really maybe the movement or anything or you may want to okay. ask. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'll call people three at a time, uh, and then and also I want to. Your time is somewhat limited, yeah. so his time is limited. So please make questions, you know, short and concise. Okay, one, two. I will three. ramble. In my response. Thank you. Um, I'm very curious to know um, how, what kind of progress this. Uh, movement for, um, you know, um, getting debts forgiven and um, for changing this structure. Have you seen any cracks in the wall of power in this country? Are you getting any response? Mm -hmm. There's two ways of, of answering that. Um, the Truth Commission that I mentioned specifically in the sermon is just getting started. So that, that hasn't done anything yet because we're just now calling together the commission in, in the storytelling phase. The larger debtors movement in this country um, is really the way I see it right now, an outgrowth of Occupy Wall Street. You know, to, so I have to sort of answer one to answer the other. Um, from the news perspective, there was a ban on, on reporting about Occupy Wall Street on a lot of the major uh, media outlets. We know this because of people who told us this directly. Um, so it may not look like there's a lot going on for Occupy, but actually underneath the surface of the waters, there are thousands of young people in this city right now working all the time. And, and they're always looking for what is the best on-ramp for a broad-based social justice uh, movement, uh, economic justice movement. And so one of those has been debt. And so the most recent interesting chink in the armor was something we worked on called Rolling Jubilee. And uh, this is now a tactic that is sort of picking up momentum. Um, have you heard of Rolling Jubilee? You know what that is? Some of us did, some of us. Well, in brief, this is the idea. What I used to do as a credit loan officer uh, or surveillance analyst was in, when you buy, when you sell debt, right, or when you, uh, Citibank owns your student loan debt, they take that debt and they pool it, they call it a pool, uh, in with hundreds of other people's outstanding debt. And that becomes, into a fixed thing called a commodity. And once all those pools of potential debt, it's very confusing and, and like Gnostic actually, once that becomes a commodity, that gets bought and sold on something called the secondary market. And now we're so abstracted from reality, it's really crazy, but this is how the American financial system works. So the idea has been around for a long time that well, if banks can buy pools of people's debt, you know what I mean? for pennies on the dollar, right? Because I'm, if I'm buying, all of you, if all of you have debt and I buy all that pool, what I'm buying is the potential to collect on all of you, right? And so I'm not paying full market value, I'm paying like, you know, five cents on the dollar to get your debt. If, if Citibank sells these pools for so little to somebody else who's gonna collect it, they're never gonna see that money. So the idea came out, what if we um, bought pools of debt for like pennies on the dollar and then cancel it. What if we just cancel it? So that's what we did. We raised enough money from something called the People's Bailout and we canceled something like half a million dollars of distressed medical debt, like that. It was just gone. And that's like a miracle, right? That's a half a million dollars of real people's lives. And to the banks, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's just a number. It has no visceral, real world contact. Um, and, but for real humans, this is life and death. Like I've lost members of my family, we all probably have, because they couldn't afford basic health care. How is this a just society? How are we still an economy? So, 
Rolling Jubilee is one of the cracks that we're starting to see. People are starting to pick up on the tactic and use it. Uh, but we're in a build mode right now. The idea is to start educating people around the debt and the, the uh, Truth Commission that I mentioned is a part of that education process. Um, it's a hard thing to get going. You're going against a lot of conditioning of the media to talk in a certain way, or to not talk about a lot of these things. But I have deep optimism. And, and as long as I'm preaching at all of you, I have deep optimism about the movement. And here's why. Because every new generation of high school uh, graduates, college graduates, are pools of people who are, who are graduating into a job market that doesn't exist, right? So our kids are coming out with huge debts, larger than ever before, debts that, are, that they'll never pay in their lifetimes, with no jobs and no retirement. This is what we're telling generations of young people, right? Where do you think they're gonna go? What do you think they're gonna do? Well, one of the places they come is to New York, <laughs> and to the Occupy movement. And if it's not this, it's something else. But once the causes and conditions of economic life become harsh enough where we can no longer play this pretend game that we're all okay, um, people will, will fill the streets again. <laughs> Next question. Oh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your words today. I thought they were uh, inspiring and uh, and uh, very informative and, and give us a great perspective on uh, the society. I have a couple of points to make. Uh, one is that recently there was a study, and, and then I'll ask a question. Uh, there was a study that um, austerity actually does not revive uh, an economy as many economists uh, or politicians on both Democrat and Republican side have been saying that you know we have to balance the budget and have austerity in order to have an economy that again will function. Actually, this study was debunked by um, a group of researchers at, in Massachusetts, maybe the, uh, at the university there, which said um, that that is not the case and because in the original study there was a lot of information left out about certain countries that did revive without austerity. In the second place, there's a new book coming out on May 21st that uh, talks about that people can be protected in their health and uh, mental health and physical health during a depression and that it cites the fact that in Greece and southern European countries the suicide rates have gone up, right. the um, uh, death from uh, lack of medical care is going up and that um, it's in terms of the United States, when FDR came in, even there was a depression that lasted 10 years, people's uh, depression, um, suicide rates, and went down their uh, physical uh, needs were cared for even uh, in the depression. So it's not a matter of economics, as some of these um, austerity hawks will tell you. Uh, it's a matter of the intention of, and the politics of the government. And the last point I want to make is that uh, it's not only debt, but we have a, everybody is aware that many, uh, that almost everybody expects another crash. Um, we have a um, financial crash of major proportions because nothing has really been fixed. So we have to, uh, at a minimum, get out from under that uh, perilous situation. Um, youth unemployment in now in the United States, in 2008 when Obama came in was 30% in only two states. Now it's 30% uh, in about 20 states, and it's getting worse. And there is a way out, in my view, and that is uh, also adhered to by 60 co-sponsors in Congress of a bill called H.R. 129, which re would reinstate the original Glass-Steagall Act. And this week, um, there's a national week of action to restore Glass-Steagall where uh, scores of people will be going down to Washington to lobby their representatives to add to the 60 names that are already on there and the 18 or 19 states which have already passed resolutions in favor of Glass-Steagall and H.R. 129 and four states have actually passed it in one or both houses by large majority. So my question is to you, would you write a letter endorsing Glass-Steagall, and in particular, not just uh, the concept, which everybody seems to assent to these days, but the actual bill 
that we could get through Congress and get another one in the Senate, and then we would have something accomplished for future generations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say it's the tip of the iceberg, right? Even if you uh, get a constitutional amendment that repeals Citizens United, right? Even if you, you guys know what Citizens United is? This is the, yeah. Even if you do this, this is also tip of the iceberg. When citizens, before Citizens United, this wasn't like all of a sudden, for the first time you had corporations controlling the democratic process. There's a whole movie about it, Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> it goes way back, right? It's a pretty good movie. And this is, uh, this is part of the nature of the free market system, right? This is part of the essential DNA of America. It's freedom, but it's freedom for certain people. And, and this is part of the racial discussion in our country, the gender discussion in our country. So we have to look at deep, deep DNA, and I'm all for it, don't get me wrong, I'll, I'll write the letter, you got my card, I'll... I, I just want to say one thing, I'm sorry, but I didn't say what the Glass-Steagall Act does. It separates commercial and investment banking, so that yeah. uh, the speculation would not be supported by your taxpayer funds or by bailouts, either by the latest scheme is to take your own deposits Right, and all that stuff is good. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm for it, I'm an organizer. I, I like to think in terms of tactics and strategy. All my friends sit up at night with like maps and we think about the future. <laughs> it's a creepy bowl, you know, going back and forth. But, but part of it is that there has to be a moral, spiritual shift in our country, right? The, the problem is, is that we have a lot of, even the need to describe what this is, like there's, a, there's an intentional separation um, of consciousness where there's a strange other language that gets spoken that's called financial inside our country. And so we're walking the news and they talk about Dow and all these things. Like who understands that? Which of us, by numbers, the majority of us don't, right? There's this other kind of narrative happening and it's made to feel us, make us feel dumb and not participating in democracy. And so my big thing is that all these, all these examples are true, but if you can turn the dialogue and recognize that this is a spiritual conversation, that everyone has a right to participate in, and if people aren't getting it, then it's the job of the whole to make sure that everybody does, to really be clear about what's going on and not obscure it in this kind of uh, magic show of financial language. And I'm with you, and I'll write the letter. But, but we've got to go deep, and that's a job that, that everyone can be part of. We can all recognize that um, there is no spiritual life separate from the concrete interactions that, that uh, bind our bodies to each other and to the planet. If you look at where our food comes from, where our resources from come from, how we deal with each other, that is our spiritual life. And if it's obscured and strange structures we don't understand, strange Gnostic entities, then there's a problem. And uh, this is what more and more Americans are waking up to, and I've kind of made it my, my personal mission to help out in some way. Sorry, okay. next question. Uh, before we get to the next question, which will be, uh, Robin, I just want to remind people that we have some limited time and would like the questions to be very concise, brief, to the point, so that we can get in as many people as possible. Thank you. Um, I also would like to thank you so much um, for what you said during the service and for your appearance here. Um, I have two relatively short statements slash questions. First one, how is the group uh, that you're with and that you're forming, how are you in terms of reaching out to regular um, mainstream politicians, Republicans, mm -hmm. Democrats, independents. Um, those are the three that we have represented right now in our Congress. How are you and your group at reaching out to these people? That's, That's a great first, question. First one. Secondly, um, I, like many people, um, I volunteered in both of his campaigns uh, for the president. Um, I have a great deal of affection for the president, for his whole family, actually. Um, I think it was good that America finally did have an obvious person of color. Um, but like many people um, on the so-called liberal left side, I am extremely disappointed in the president. Yeah. 
I think that he's made um, a great many mistakes. I think that he started off um, wrong, started off on the wrong foot with his first administration um, in that he went in basically with his hat in his hand instead of with a baseball bat. And um, I think that we're suffering because of that. I want you to give us your feelings on the first question and secondly, how do you feel the president fits into this whole economic thing with the debt? Is he a bad guy? Is he just a tool? What do you think? We're all just tools. Um, no, I, I think I can answer these questions together. Um, who doesn't like Obama, right? What kind of person would you be if you, <laughs> you can't, how do you not love Obama? But the role of president is something very specific. It's an economic role. It's a political role. And there are limits, there's a vast expanse between the rhetoric of how we talk about the powers of president and the realities of how our economics and political system works. So, so I'll say that by going back to the first question, how involved are we so far with political politicians and whatnot? Not at all, by design. Right? The whole idea of a mass movement is that you're trying to activate people who do not have access to the political process through the traditional channels. The traditional channels are we buy our way into the system. People who have enough m money have a vote, and that's true on the left or the right. We've said the words plutocracy in this country, and that used to be like 10 years ago, you say that America is a plutocracy, and somehow you're a fringe thinker. Now Bill Boyer says it, right? <laughs> like now it's just like, well, yeah, we're kind of a plutocracy. Like what definition are we not a plutocracy? I beg anyone, people were handing out oil checks on the floor of the Senate. We're a plutocracy, we have been for a long, long time, and now Post Citizens United, it's official. So no, we are not working with elected officials yet. And part of this is a power builder. The idea is to build a grassroots campaign around money, debt, and power by getting to real people's voices and talking about how these things really play out. Um, so in phase one of the Truth Commission, we're collecting stories around the country. Our intent is very much to get average American people talking about all their stories. I've already heard some here today in this coffee hour. Um, we're trying to get them all in one location. The second thing we're doing and just starting to work on now is trying to gather the actual Truth Commission board. And people like Cornell West, and how, who do you get to represent the people in a broad, diverse, from different parts of life, who can actually, uh, it's, like a, it's like a public tribunal. It's saying that a vast injustice has been done systematically. And the friends of ours are helping us think about this uh, from the Greensboro Truth Commission. The former executive director there had been helping us do the intellectual thinking about how this gets structured and worked. But uh, at, at some point, once that Truth Commission uh, has done all of the fact-finding and the stories come together, it'll issue a report. There'll be a lot of fanfare and work around. It will be trying to use this as a movement builder. And then at some point, we may be going to politicians and making demands. But that would be uh, the tail end of something that is designed to be a mass movement builder. Um, you don't go and ask for them anything in advance unless you want to wait in line or unless you have a big checkbook. So Obama, I mean, who doesn't? I, I like Obama. I, 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 you know, what's that test they said about Bush? Like, do you want to have a beer with him? And like, I don't drink beer, but I'd have one with Obama. He's a lovely guy. But I never expected that much. And I was like the one raining on everyone's parade back <laughs> during the election, saying like, this is great, but don't expect much from an American president. You can't expect much from an American president. I mean, if all the stars align in the right way, and you've got a, what's his name, David Ickes, who was underneath FDR, um, who's that great guy who made the CCC happen and all that like, fun stuff? Harold. Harold. Yeah, Harold, he's my hero. I love that guy. You know, I, I woke up with fantasies about all that stuff. Like when we were growing up, I grew up, I was born in the 70s. You know, you, you think, oh, what an amazing moment in American life. But I don't expect that to happen anymore. And there are concrete laws and systems in place that say it's not going to happen. So you have to, you know, when, when the legal system has outspent you and is designed against 
uh, certain kinds of policies. I, you know, I have some sympathy. Obama has to have his hat in his hand a little bit. Now that said, I wish he would have used, and still wish he would use, the presidency as more of a bully pulpit for the issues, and especially now in the second term. I'm hoping that regardless of what he's able to move legislatively, that he can become a moral voice. I think that that's kind of where he wants to be on some level. He's an academic, but we all respond so well to him when he, when he gets into this mode that my, my prayer for him is that he will be able to street, speak truth to power in a way that the rest of us can't. I don't get invited to those things, so it's gotta be, we gotta be home, Bob. Uh, Ray, then Robert, and three, and then back up. One truth that you helped me to realize this morning with your mention of Deuteronomy is that we all know corporations are people and one truth that anyone could say is, well, apparently they're not Christian or Jewish people. Yeah. I mean, in other words, one could ask, what kind of people are they? Yeah. And not having emotions, it wouldn't be painful for them to give away all their wealth. Yeah. Like it might be for a human person. Anyway, besides that, and I guess I'd like to hear whatever comment you have on it, it was nice to hear the Georgist sounding ideas, who was a religious, spiritual person, not your typical atheist scientist or, uh, of today. And I guess I'd like to hear if you would recommend the writings of Henry George, Progress and Poverty and those ideas. I haven't read them since college. Uh, well, okay. But, but yeah, I'm sure they're good, right? All right, thank you. And uh, I'm not very well read. Thank you again for Deuteronomy. No, thank you very much. You know, the, uh, corporations also don't get sick and they don't go into uh, debt because of healthcare. And um, this is a typical response. Um, when you, I, I work with people who do a lot of foreclosure work. Um, when you sign a house, when you sign the mortgage, your house is collateral. Well, what's the bank's collateral, right? What's, what the, and, and the legal documents say, someone won a court case for this in the 60s, and now they're winning cases again here in New York City. This idea that when you put up uh, an economic transaction, it's gotta be collateral on both sides. Well, the person's putting up the house, what's this entity called the corporation putting up? Well, they're not even putting up money, because the money they're putting up is potential money, right? It's debt, <laughs> it's the potential, it's the future. This is the way the financial system creates money. So once upon a time in 1968, someone actually sued the bank who was trying to foreclosure in their house saying, you did not legally comply. You had nothing, you were putting up the risk. There's no equality here. I'm putting up where I live. You're putting up nothing. And he won the case. And people are winning the cases like this even now. And yet somehow this does not have wide valence currency inside the legal system. So I don't know how that's working, but I know that uh, people who are working on foreclosure work here in the city with robocalls are doing this. But it's another example of how the corporation gets the benefits of a human, but none of the risk of being human. Not a lot of corporations have a broken heart, you know what I mean, all these things that we suffer from, running noses, stubbed toes. There you go. Maybe they do, I don't know. Um, you know, for the longest unjust war in America, Afghanistan, and the American people, uh, the average American is somehow um, unresponsive to, the, and, uh, and to their role. To, so it seems to me when the American people, um, justly or not, are suffering economically, I can only um, summon to mind the words of Reverend Wright, God damn America. Why should I, we, these are consumers who are now worried about um, their, their immiseration to debt, but they're, they're complicit in the raining down of horrors day by day to the peoples of the world abroad. Um, so I don't, you know, the American people, um, do we, are we to bleed for them while they don't bleed for the misery they cause around the world? Well, that's a great point, and of course you're exactly right. But we should, we should uh, care for all those people caught up in systems of suffering. Because part of the things that we realize is that the American people don't have the full consciousness of what this reality actually means. I mean, one of, one of the reasons I am a Christian minister is for the very nature of having these kinds of conversations. Because this is the only place outside uh, commercials and government, which is another form of commercials, 
um, to actually have this kind of public exchange. I'm, I'm, I hear you. I know there's people who really ideologically uh, go lockstep with war in Afghanistan, but I, I believe that there's kind of a systemic numbing that comes from our culture. There's a consumerism that we, we exist in, in kind of a, a haze, and I, I think that this is a larger conversation. This is another way of talking about the whole thing, but, but I, think, I think we should have empathy for folks who are voting alongside this, and uh, there's ignorance that's happening. I don't think people fully realize what it's like to go to Afghanistan. I'm, I'm against the war. I'm against, I've been against the war from the beginning. It's Obama's biggest public failing to me is that he continued the war. That and immigration policy. Immigra Obama's horrible on immigration. Just terrible. Far more people deported and it's a long, these are longer stories that we could possibly get into in this setting, but in short, it is terrible, yes. But I'm hopeful. Ray Clark. Um, the other night, uh, I saw a C-SPAN about 12 to 2.30 in the morning. At the 16th Baptist Church, they were honoring and remembering the 50th anniversary of the children's crusade. Yes. And I didn't even remember there was a children's crusade. Yeah. And they talked about selective buying all the blacks in Birmingham. Yeah. And then 99 and some percentage of them did not shop at the stores. And I, I really, and one of the men there, who was a leader of the children's campaign, said, Americans have no respect for Obama. And the Ku Klux Klan is in the Senate, in Congress, the United States. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my goodness, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. And what I feel with your thing, I, w I want to reach out to all the black churches and to be a part of this movement. And I feel where I'm late in coming to the, there should be in the UUA in June an, an action for immediate doing presented by some member of community church that's going to GA. Because it's in the South, where, and all over the country, we need to unify and get thinking those Tea Party people, the, Amen. the evangelic and the conservative Christians. And then I, you know, I've not, a, I have never read the Bible cover to cover. My sister did several times. But I, I, what are you really doing? Are you really going to send, and I thought we have a black man, Bob Gums, around the country to meet with all those ministers and all those people who understand debt. And one of the young people said at the meeting, they had high school and junior high, why are you at the 16th Baptist Church? And the man there said, because Shuttleworth's church was bombed twice. And his, heart, well, his home was bombed twice. And those girls, one of them was decapitated in the bombing there. They only recognized who she was by a ring or something that was on her finger. And, you know, that's the Boston mass Massacre happened in 50 years ago in the church school. And I came to community church that Sunday and sat with Reverend Leonard, and it was a horrible Sunday. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I want to, you've got, we need to work. And I think you can bring together, not so much the commission, but even Cornel West, he may be good, but I don't think he's, the person in the street there. I agree. And we need a we need a on that commission a black man in the street. Yeah, I agree with you actually a hundred percent. And um, 
there's a, you, you've said some different things, and so I, I want to unpack it, and, I, and this might have to be my, my last before I, I have to depart back. I, someone's being ordained, and I, I have to be there, but, but let's go through this a piece at a time. First is the UU specifically, right? You talked about work inside the GA. I am uh, not UU. I probably should be UU. I think, yeah. I think you guys are very radical. I, I didn't know what to expect. Like, was I going to get kicked out for talking about debt forgiveness? I figured Bruce is pretty radical. Like, that'd be okay. But I was going to take a shot at capitalism. You guys were like, yeah, that's capitalism. <laughs> so I don't know how those structures would work. I work with Bruce a little bit. Rosemary Bray McNabb up at Fourth U is a good friend of mine. And so if someone else would have to lead the specific, because uh, I also run a church, so someone else would have to do that, and I could staff them with information, materials, and humans. Right? So if someone wants to do that, Rosemary would help, maybe Bruce will help too, I'm all for it. Um, as far as specifically getting this out in the African American communities, that's been my priority since starting to think about this. This, this grew out of a pivot of Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Faith. A lot of my friends were the people who started the Occupy movement. I was the person who said, oh, it's never gonna work. <laughs> and it, and it, it did, it did work, more than I thought it was gonna work. Um, but these are friends, and they're anarchists, and, and they don't always love religion, but we're trying to, to, I'm making the argument that you have to speak within the churches. Here in the city, that meant a lot of work on debt with uh, Gary Simpson at Concord Baptist, uh, Clint Miller at uh, uh, Brown Memorial Baptist Church in Brooklyn. There's a lot of examples of this. Um, at Trinity, Otis Moss in Chicago, because what we're seeing more than not, when, it, when you actually look to ask the question, who's talking about debt in a, in a spiritual contest, what it is, is largely African-American preachers talking about debt, but with a completely different analysis than the one that I laid out. Their analysis is, is yeah, debt's bad, you should get out of it, right? <laughs> and you should all... Uh, uh, strength, uh, tighten your boot, your, what do you call it, your belt, <laughs> yeah, boot, or whatever, some metaphor, <laughs> right. I was thinking like tighten your belt, and you've got to uh, live within your means and be responsible, it's like, well, there might be truth to that, right, maybe that's, maybe we all have to like live within our means, et cetera, et cetera, but I call BS on anyone talking that way when the wealthy people in this country are not living within their means, and they're holding the resources for all of us, so, uh, it's a reprehensible thing that we should be telling poor people that they need to be responsible. This is horrifying. And so uh, for my uh, piece, I'm trying to actually recruit. One of the things I do is talk about these things directly, but then on my spare time, I go out and try to recruit people for the movement and get them talking about it. And I don't even care what they do. I just want them to talk about it in their churches. This has to be a consciousness shift moment that happens. And we're at a frustrating time because, you know, in spiritual communities, people don't really talk about debt in the way we've been talking about debt today. But that's shifting. And one of the things I always say uh, to people to be encouraged is that, uh, you know, <clears throat> right now, it, it's so easy to get discouraged about the numbers and the people who are going with Afghanistan. And, you know, of course, it's frustrating. It's difficult. But right now, if you and I decide that we're not gonna live in the world that does these things. We're not gonna allow debt to work this way between us, right? We could lay out a list of the way that we are going to create, not what we're against, but what we're for. What kind of economy do we want between us? What kind of way do we treat each other? How do we, how do we act? And now we're two. Now we're two. Now there's two of us, and our society is this big right now. And right now in this room, that society has sway over anything else. And I would argue that most people probably here agree with the general principles of what we're saying, so we have this room. We have this block. And it's one block at a time. It's one block at a time. We take this country one piece at a time. And we don't have to. The laws, and we give so much power to the state and the corporations. Let's figure out how to stop using money. <laughs> Plenty of people are doing it. Let's not, who cares what the laws are? Let's decide for ourselves how we're going to socially interact. Let's decide what kind of society we're gonna build and let's just do it. And eventually we will be irresistible. We will make friends with everyone until it hurts. And that's what movement building is. And you're all now officially deputized and part of it. And you don't have to call it Occupy if you don't want. But call it something and stand for it. I have to go. <laughs>
Okay. And you don't need me to do it. But but what I want to say is I, I I'm not just saying this. I don't I don't actually go speak from Judson a whole lot. It's really a pleasure. And and you're all really wonderful. But I live right down the street at Judson Memorial Church. <laughs> and you all there's I'll leave the rest of my cards up here, but Bruce has it. And and if you want to learn more about what's happening in the movement or death and spirituality, you can reach out to me. You can talk, we can meet. I can uh, figure out more ways to plug in with the People's Investigation or Rolling Jubilee, or even just like, there's other, there's other fronts, there's other ways to think about these things. But from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you so much for the very, very warm. Thank you.